uh, no pun in intended, but Danielle Keller uh, Averam is a sustainable jewelry consultant, researcher, and lecturer. She has worked with Sibjo, with RJC, Fairmind, and others in developing sustainable action plans. And one of her specialities is actually on circularity and the circular economy. And she is going to provide an overview, and that's what I was saying about kind of closing the circle on all these themes, on sustainability and circularity in jewelry and watches. So thank you for coming, Danielle. And once the computer works, we'll have you talk to us about that. Here on the air. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so by now, you heard quite a lot of uh, sustainability-related uh, talks. So I will try to not go over other topics or areas that other people already mentioned, uh, but maybe refer to a few other talks really interesting that we had in the previous uh, days. Um, so as Lauren uh, really generously mentioned, I'm a sustainable jewelry consultant and researcher, and I've been working around this field for around six years after I've previously worked around jewelry design. Um, and I would like, maybe it's a bit strange to finalize all of these talks, but I would like to start with maybe um, kind of like straight a line about what sustainability is actually meaning. Um, Kyle mentioned wording and terminology as like a key element in her presentation, and I think it's a really key element because sustainability or ethical or eco means a lot of different things for different people in different places. So I decided to choose two definitions. So the first one is uh, treating the world as if we planned to stay here. And I think it refers to also what's happening currently and our wish or our will that our kids or grandkids or future generations without blood connection would have the same wonderful life that we have. So they would be able to enjoy nature. They would have access to clean uh, water. They would have access to uh, food to clean air, uh, and maybe even more advanced wishes, uh, like traveling or uh, meeting in a trade show, uh, different people from all around the world. The second definition is uh, one by the United Nations. Um, I think both of them are emphasizing on uh, really similar elements. So it, it focuses on meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So again, it goes back to this ongoing life cycle that we need to somehow maintain the system that we are living in. So we are not one species uh, operating in a closed system. The plants, the animals, other societies, other countries, other cultures, we are all interconnected and we have um, uh, different impacts on one another. Um, I also chose this sustainable um, sustainability model um, that Alex uh, presented in her presentation because I think sustainability is around balance, uh, so balancing different forces. Um, society on one hand, the environment on the other hand, and the economy or the economical system at the same time. Um, so if just one area of sustainability is pushed too much to one direction, then it's not really around sustainability. So when we're talking about sustainability, we need to somehow find, address all areas and find the right uh, point in the center where everything is somehow connected and interacts well with one another. So we need to think maybe about our relationship with local again, uh, against global, how we are managing natural resources. At the same time, maybe think about systems in which we can um, give incentives or benefits to encourage economical progress towards prosperity. Um, and at that point, also maybe refer to concepts like business ethic and what does it ex actually means and fair trade. Um, it's also important to think about that sustainability in the core essence of that is about efficiency. 
Um, so it's again related to economical kind of like way of thinking. We don't want to waste resources or materials. Um, so we want to create a system that is um, thinking about the whole kind of like journey or the whole kind of like supply chain, the whole production. Um, I don't know if you heard about this person. Uh, his name is called Hans Karl von Karlowitz. He was German, uh, and he was wo operating around um, tree frustration in 1713. Um, and um, his whole point of view was around efficient and long-term mindset and kind of like a preserving uh, point of view. Uh, he wrote a book about the instructions of wild tree cultivation, which can be really, to some people, like how it's connected to jewelry. But I will get there in a minute. Um, but he, um, he kind of like launched a term called sustainable use. So we would use m natural materials in the rhythm that they grow. So we need to think about, for example, if we cut now a tree that we want to build a house out of that, we need to think when we would want to destroy the house and the new tree would need to grow by that time so we could cut that again to build a new house. Um, so we need to think about these time frames and how they interact with our supply and demand of materials. Um, so as a really hard or like sharp shift. Um, this is a, a map, a world map from the Color Gemstone uh, Working Group um, source. Um, it's, although it's mainly focused on colored gemstones, I think it highlights quite well that the jewelry industry or the materials that we are working with daily, probably all of us together, are coming from all around the world. And they are moving from one point to the other, from one country to the other, from one continent to the other. Um, and this is how not just the jewelry uh, supply chain is developed, it's how a lot of supply chains for different materials are operating now. We are living in a global world and things are connected. But this traveling, extensive traveling, especially for really precious minerals that can be sometimes just packed in a pocket of someone and then cross borders or cross continents um, can put um, a lot of risks, um, social and environmental risks, because we don't necessarily have full control over these extensive traveling that our minerals are passing through. So this is a list of a few um, of the most common countries where mining and initial processing is happening, where refining and processing of not just metals, but also um, stones and diamonds. And the same is where the massive production of jewelry components is um, being done. Uh, but all along this process, most companies don't have full control. And then at this point, they are exposed to a lot of risks. Um, some of the risks I'm sure you heard about, uh, extensive energy use um, that is uh, a well-discussed topic around Germany uh, in the last year as a result of energy, um, but also everything around waste, um, solid or liquid as well. Like It's clear that we are um, using a lot of products, at the same time getting rid of a lot of products quite fast. And in a lot of situations, these waste streams don't end up in our garbage or in our city. They are shipped to other countries. Uh, so they might be far away from our eyes, but they are somewhere on the planet. They are not disappearing, for sure. Uh, we also see some of these impacts more close to the jewelry industry, you know, like toxic chemicals that are leaked into rivers or lakes that are directly sitting next to communities in different countries. Um, everything around labor rights um, involving children or forced labor. So this is still unfortunately happening. And when you don't have 
full control on your supply chain, these things might be associated with how you work. Um, so here you see kind of like uh, an overview of the most common um, issues or challenges uh, from my kind of like research and understanding of how the jewelry supply chain is working. Uh, I divided it into four main levels as I see it at the moment. So there is in the upper part, you see the material level and all the issues and challenges that are more associated with the material level. Below is the product development stage, which has its own issues uh, in other areas around the world, the manufacturing and the last part, which most um, I would say sustainable perspective um, is not covering until this point is the product life cycle or the end of life of products. So what happens once we stop using jewelry what, or watches? What happens to them then? Um, still, regardless of all of these problems that sometimes are hard to ignore, um, there are some solutions. Um, each one of them has its own benefits and things that are not covered and loopholes. Um, I think that probably all speakers spoke about sustainability can definitely agree that perfect doesn't exist. We are not even close to that. We have a really high mountain ahead of us and we are really slowly climbing this mountain. At the same time, I think that it's really interesting to be familiarized with some of these schemes and understand what they are covering, what their strengths are, and finding the right systems to use. Maybe a certificate is not right for your business, but maybe you can use some of the resources. Some of these, like the OECD, for example, framework is mainly focused around conflict minerals and everything around risk assessment. Um, it's free, it's accessible for everyone, and you don't necessarily need to be certified or paid anyone, but it's a great knowledge basis to understand how and in, in which sphere you operate and could give you better understanding and control. Um, the RJC was mentioned, the Responsible Jewelry Council was mentioned in a few um, lectures around sustainability. They are, they are great, they are doing a lot of really interesting things, but again, they are not covering everything, nothing Nothing puts you in a perfect place, that you're just in best practices in all areas, no matter where you operate. Um, and of course, there are more general certifications like uh, B Corp or the Global Recycled Standard um, that are not necessarily focused on jewelry, but can have other benefits. Um, so I think it's, it's important to, to find the right system in which it fits to your business or to your supply chain. Um, but before kind of like moving uh, to um, last part, I think it's really important to also acknowledge that the industry is still lacking uh, a big part of data in order to really understand where the biggest risks or where the biggest impacts are laid. So there are still areas where we don't have information about the environmental impact or the social impacts in a full scope. Um, sorry. Really important, don't forget that. Um, so there is a big lack of data and I think it also impacts the industry performance around sustainability because it's harder to know where really your true risks or your true negative impacts lay because you don't have a lot of information out there. Um, so um, this is a big challenge when addressing sustainability in general. And now to my passionate topic, the circular economy. Again, it was mentioned in few other con uh, talks before, uh, but I would like to maybe kind of like present the concept in a more basic form and then try and give a few examples of 
companies that I find that are doing interesting things. So the circular economy in general is kind of like in a mindset that is the opposite from the linear industrial revolution supply chain model. So then we are thinking all the time about the ongoing life cycle of products and materials. And the, um, the model has few main principles that you can see them now. Um, eliminating waste and pollution, um, thinking about the ongoing uh, process of material and products flow and use, so how we can um, think about the next life cycle of the materials or the, pros or the products, and I think these two key elements are especially relevant when we are talking about jewelry and watches, because these are, first of all, items that are made from precious materials, so they have high economical value in a lot of situations, and they are really durable, so gold, that you have on you, or silver, or precious stones, or diamonds, whatever, they were probably on Earth, even if below ground, way before we all were here, and they're gonna stay way long after we are all gonna be gone. They are not gonna disappear, they are not gonna decompose, they are here to stay. Um, so thinking, embracing this mindset of how we can repurpose, reuse, remake, share, rent, whatever, the items is a really key element, especially with these kind of materials. Um, the model in general is based on sourcing energy from renewable resources, uh, regenerate natural systems, and separating biocycle from tech cycle, which in the jewelry industry is less relevant because all of our materials can't decompose in the soil. So all of the materials maybe come from ground but can't disappear. So we need to think about ways in which we can remake, reuse, recycle, re 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 uh, the materials. Um, so the circular economy is regenerative by design um, and it aims to gradually decouple growth from the consumption of finite resources. So thinking about resources in a much longer time frame. Um, the difference between biological and technical spheres and materials and the different opportunities that exist to keep materials and products in use. Um, so this is my own translation to the circular economy model that is reflected on the jewelry industry. So how I would imagine from understanding the concept, um, how it can be translated in, into how the jewelry industry operates. At this point, it's really important to highlight that all of these dashed lines are potential loops that could be incorporated within the industry, whereas this blue oval loop is a loop that actually already exists within how the industry was brought up from the beginning. So gold and silver and a lot of other metals are recasted and recycled automatically since humans started working with gold. So because they were so precious and shiny and perceived as rare, they were already reused and remade into new items whenever there was no use with them. At the same time, when we are thinking now about our global supply chain, these recycled systems are still happening relatively in smaller niche areas. There is not global system that kind of like condensed everything, there is no, if gold is traded in the stock exchange and there is a price for gold every day, for recycled gold, it's not the situation. Even understanding what recycled gold is, is quite complicated. If you would now compare five organizations recycled gold definitions, you would get different outcomes. Some refer to only post-consumer, so what happens after we use the gold. Some are like, what happened maybe after it was man manufactured, some after it was refined. Some so it's really a vague wording area that we are operating, and I think this, again, causing the fact where recycled can be in some situations um, um, perceived as not the best sustainable way to 
uh, work with gold or with silver, because it, it at the moment how the, um, the system is structured is not yet a reassurance um, label or anything. It doesn't mean anything globally. It's not standardized. Um, so we need to start thinking about the use cycle of these materials. So we need to think about shared economy models, prolonging um, the lifespan of, um, of products, thinking about reusing materials or products as a whole, thinking about remaking, remanufacturing, um, and just at the end of this process, reaching the recycling point. So once this material or product cannot be used anymore, just then we turn on to, to the recycling solution. So we need to think again or build systems and structures in which recycle is not the first option we go to. Because again, recycling does require some resources like energy. Ne you need to heat the metal in order to melt it, in order to create something new from that. Um, and the same with stones or with diamonds. They probably need to be repolished in order to be used again. So here, I don't know if you can see, because there is some strange thing with the text uh, suddenly. But um, these are some business ideas that could be implemented for different businesses around uh, the circular economy. So. We need to make sure, or, we, or ideally, we need to make sure that products go through loops of sharing, of longer use, of reusing. Maybe we need to educate our customers on how to take care of their products better, or what they can do once they don't want the products. Maybe they can return it to, to us and we sell it in their name. There are a lot of different options and opportunities here um, that are also can create a lot of benefits, like loyal customers coming back to us for ongoing services, like we can offer may maybe repairs. Uh, there are now more and more businesses around the world that this is the only thing that they offer. And it's well connected to what you see here, the Restory. It's a UK-based company that I think got a big investment from Caring last year. Uh, I'm not sure about the exact date, but they for, su for sure got investment from Caring. They're offering on-demand service, um, providing modern aftercare for luxury items. At the moment, mainly shoes, handbags, and knitwear. But jewelry fits in that scope quite well, just requires a bit different uh, skills and artisan skills and craftsmanship. Um, so they are using high craftsmanship um, that are through this repair offering hopefully uh, will make their customers fall in love with the products that they already own instead of buying a new Chanel ba bag or a new Manolo Blahnik pair of shoes. Um, their artisans are proactively seek for ways to develop new techniques to fit modern standards. Um, and, um, and they're actually dealing with daily impossible repair problems and trying to find high-end premium solutions, um, also educating and encouraging their clientele to take better care of their products. Um, on this side, on yeah, uh, you see a capsule collection from Pomeletto. I think it was released last year. Um, and they used the traditional Kintsugi, Japanese uh, mending technique. I hope uh, I said it correctly. Um, and they upcycle damaged gemstones. And using this Japanese technique, they um, mend them together uh, so they could be repurposed. So also kind of like embracing the beauty or the aesthetics of imperfection. And it correlates quite well with uh, the gemstones in the industry in general that is uh, in general discussing around inclusions within stones. So seeing these kind of like lines of impurity within stones in general. Um, another interesting circular uh, concept is design for disassembly. So when we work with materials that can't be recycled altogether because they are coming from different worlds, so like gemstones and gold can't be recycled as one, they need to be separated. 
Um, so thinking about ways that it makes it easy to remove or replace maybe products or components that are broken um, or needs to be repaired. Uh, there is a great example for that, not from the jewelry sphere, uh, but from the smartphone industry where we see Fairphone that actually with a really easy, easily user-friendly interface, you can replace parts of your phone that are broken or needs to be changed. Um, and, um, and this is um, a mindset that is already needs to be implemented while you plan the product. So you need to think about what happens to it at the end of this product journey in order to make it easily um, separatable. Um, and um, this example here, it's an Indian brand um, that they developed a mechanism that easily separates the pendant from the chain. Um, so it could be integrated into a ring or into a brooch. So in that way, maybe you don't need a brooch and a necklace and a ring. You can have kind of like a multi-purposeful item that you just kind of like disassemble easily the main element and connect it to a new base mechanism. Hard to not talk about resale when we're talking about the circular economy. So here you have Circa. Um, we had also a person from eBay Luxury uh, talking about um, their platform offering more resale um, luxury items. But Circa is um, a brand that is only buying and reselling luxury jewelry and watches. Not only branded here in this image, it looks like only branded, but they also sell and buy non-branded, but fine premium jewelry. Um, and their big advantage is that as part of the process of buying or selling through their platform, they, they have expert that evaluates the items and they give reassurance to whoever buys the item and whoever who sells the item. So you would know that the diamond that you are buying in the scope of the jewelry is actually what the buyer described and that the gold is the same carat as you got in the document. So you have the, so it's kind of like instead of going to a Cartier shop and then getting all this information from the sales representative, you get it from a mechanism of reassurance through the company. Um, and the example here, uh, I think it's a really interesting, I don't know if you can see. No, probably no. Uh, so in their marketing advertisement, it's written that you never actually own a Patek Philippe. You merely look after it for the next generation. Um, so I think in that way of phrasing things, um, it doesn't put the item as, it doesn't downgrade the item, whereas it actually creates um, a really, it's so high and so valuable and so luxurious that you can't even own it. It's not yours. You're just like, it passes through you until it would go to the next user, um, making it maybe even more desirable and more rare from the perspective of how the product is perceived. And this is a commercial, I think, from a magazine. So it's not like something random from like a small advertisement. Um, last um, examples are around uh, material reuse and resource and repurposing. Um, I think in one of the presentations today, um, there was um, someone mentioning Zenith. Um, so they are creating watches. And recently they did a collaboration um, with Nona Source that they are uh, part of LVMH group. And basically what they are doing is that they are repurposing fabric and leather leftovers from the LVMH maisons, so things that are not used anymore, and there are a lot of that, because when you create a bag, when you create shoes, you have a lot of leather leftovers, you have a lot of textile leftovers. And for a watch, you actually need a relatively small amount of fabric or leather to create the strap. So they are repurposing these kind of materials um, that, again, keep the quality of the LVMH, uh, so these are really high materials, premium materials in uh, really good quality. Um, 
And this is instead of sourcing new materials. Um, the example in the middle is from a brand called Article 22. They are based in Laos. And I think their repurposing story is really interesting. And they took it to a really strong storytelling that it's quite hard to stay, um, to not respond to that emotionally. So they are telling that 250 million bombs were dropped on Laos during the Vietnam War. 80 million of them haven't exploded. So they are contaminating the soil every day. So what Article 22 is doing, they are collaborating with a responsible, explosive organization that is digging the bounds out of the ground, dismantling the different parts. And then the, the brand repurposes the materials, the metals, which are usually the, um, the covers of the bomb. And from that, they're creating jewelry. So actually, by any bangle that you buy, you clear three square meters of bombed Laotian land. Um, I don't know. I think it's quite hard not to be a bit emotional about that. Um, the last example is Ether. Uh, they are based in the US. They are a relatively new company, but they are doing really interesting thing. They are creating lab-grown diamonds from 100% atmospheric carbon. So they are directed air capturing technology that extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and transform it into diamonds that we all know and that are actually made from 100% carbon. Uh, all of that using 100% um, renewable energy. Um, so again, I think it's quite provoking ideas that maybe a few years ago weren't even like on people's mind. But our industry is based on such precious materials that it's quite strange to look at them as trendy items that we replace every few months or even few years, actually. Um, yeah, I think that probably by now you're exhausted from all the talks. You heard so much about sustainability that your brain is overflowed with information. So I thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions or want to reach out, I would be happy to hear from you. And I think this is it for now. Any question or comment from the audience? No, in that case, I would just have a comment. I really want to thank the translators who are hiding in the box over there for their help and their very good work. Thank you very much. And all the technical team and the people who are filming this event. So all the talks will actually be on YouTube. Uh, so it will be available. And this is made possible through the, the filmers, the video crew, and also the technical team. So thank you again. And thank you to all the audience who attended these talks. And uh, we'll see you next year again. Thank you, Danielle, and all the speakers as well. Thank you very much. Is this your computer? No, it's. Okay. Oh, thank you.